Okay, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, session that is a special session 3D uh, that will be about emergent design uh, challenges for embedded systems and paths forward. And we will be looking actually four aspects into this by different speakers. And I will be one of the speakers, the last one. I'm also basically chairing this session. So I'm Amit Singh from University of Essex, UK. So our first speaker will be Martin Deti, actually who co-founded the uh, Dresden Research Center of Huawei Technologies, where, where he worked as a principal research engineer. And he's currently focusing on heterogeneous hardware and mixed reality quality systems. So he's going to talk about theory versus practice that he has observed into his career for the mixed criticality systems. So Martin, uh, please uh, uh, share your slides and we will be taking the uh, questions and answers after each talk. So basically we are targeting like 12 minutes of the presentations and last three minutes for Q and A's. But if you have further questions, there will be email IDs you can send to that or you can come to the gather town and I can copy the link in a bit, yeah. Okay, Martin, please go ahead. Thank you for, for your introduction, Amit. Uh, good uh, morning, good uh, afternoon, good evening, good night, whatever works in your time zone. Before I start, let me just quickly explain the affiliation. Yes, I have indeed uh, helped starting, starting the Dresden Research Center of Huawei, but I have just recently joined another company, Current Concept, but I will keep the, the original affiliation just for the sake of um, me being uh, uh, part of Huawei for a long time. Okay, uh, let's talk about mixed criticality systems for a while. What are mixed criticality systems? Uh, without giving any, any formal definition, uh, a mixed criticality system is a computer system that uh, tries to accommodate, accommodate two types of workloads. First, a high criticality workload. You can imagine a car braking system, for example, that has strict requirements on safety, security, real-time behavior, and other properties. And on the other hand, uh, a low criticality workload, again, you can imagine a car infotainment system, uh, which typically focuses on, on raw performance and especially uh, vendor and user customization. Now, ideally, in an ideal world, uh, it would be probably best to just uh, consider every system a high criticality system, every workload a high criticality workload. I mean, it, not, nothing can go wrong if you just consider the most uh, you know, strict uh, level of safety, security, etc. Unfortunately, uh, in, in the real world, this is unpractical and sometimes even prohibitive. Uh, let's talk about why. First, the, the high criticality workloads, uh, they are quite costly to design and to implement. There are direct costs. Uh, the process of the validation, verification, certification of high criticality workloads is very labor intensive and uh, also time consuming. And uh, what is even more complicated is the fact that the, these uh, validation, certification, verification processes need to be done with every major change of the whole system. Uh, so uh, it's, it's really hard to, to make these systems uh, sort of customizable. And they, we really need to focus on, or, or we need to use very strictly requirements driven development processes and methodologies like the V model. Also, it's not just about the software, it's also about the hardware and the hardware for high criticality systems or workloads is typically quite costly and it is performance limited. So if we compare this to the requirements on the typical low criticality workloads, uh, that's quite a different, different story. Uh, first, there, there are usually no a priori well-defined requirements on the low criticality systems. We are usually talking about qualitative you know, uh, properties like user experience that are uh, not uh, easy to, to quantify precisely. 
also the criteria for correctness of such systems, they are, they are not really so clear. I mean, we often speak about uh, something being good enough, but that, that's really hard to, to really quantify. And also the development process of the low criticality workloads is typically iterative or prototype driven. We usually use various agile methodologies. So if we would like to combine these two worlds, these high criticality workloads in, and low criticality workloads into a single computing system, we have a problem. And uh, there is a straightforward solution to this problem, of, of course. And this uh, straightforward solution is called physical separation. And uh, this is something that has been done in, in the Eurospace or automotive industry and, and other fields, um, maybe up until the 2010s. So really separating uh, uh, the high criticality workloads and the low criticality uh, workloads physically on the hardware level and defining one-way interfaces between those two, those two uh, worlds. Uh, generally speaking, uh, the low criticality system, the low criticality components should not feed data to the high criticality components, only vice versa. Unfortunately, there are some drawbacks to this uh, simple solution. Uh, the biggest problem is the underutilization of the hardware resources, because you really need to have separate physical hardware, separate CPUs and other other hardware parts for, for the high criticality and low criticality workloads. And this also increases the, the, the physical mass, the, the, the weight of the thing due to more, uh, due, due to the need of having more cabling, etc. So uh, a very attractive alternative to this would be a logical separation. So not separating the high criticality and low criticality workloads on the physical level, on the hardware level, but let's say on the software level. And again, as you can probably imagine, this is not trivial. Uh, you know, uh, creating the same strong assurances of the separation and non-interference on purely software level is not easy. And here we come to the, to the core of my talk. I would like to compare the typical approaches uh, for this logical separation in mixed criticality systems that are being used in academic research and in industry. Uh, sadly, in, in 15 minutes, we cannot really go into much detail. But to summarize, the academic approaches, uh, they are clearly on the high criticality side of, of the problem. So uh, they, they focus on, on strong, typically formal assurances for, for the high criticality workloads. And, and they're sort of, you know, try to, uh, try to move the low criticality workloads into black boxes or virtual machines, uh, isolating them from, from the rest of the system, making sure that they don't, they don't interfere and uh, making sure that they only consume, let's say the spare resources of the system. This is usually done in many of these approaches by carefully constraining the design space of, of the system. And moreover, this is typically done by sort of trading the strong guarantees in, in the realm of the, of the proof assumptions for increased complexity outside of the realm of the proof assumptions. In other words, making sure that, that uh, you know, the, the proof assumptions uh, can, uh, for those parts that you would like to verify, the, the high criticality workloads are, are reasonable and they and could be met. Uh, making this, these parts of the system as simple as possible so that the, the, the four methods are applicable on them. Uh, this obviously works. I mean, there are, there are prime examples for this, like the SCL4 microkernel and, and other systems you might have known, uh, you might have heard of, but arguably this is not really creating uh, uh, an overall system that is more reliable and dependable because it's sort of, uh, creates this imbalance of, of the 
complexity on the on the low criticality side of 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 this composition and it creates various uh, anti patterns like the abstraction or abstraction inversion on the other hand what what is done in the industry if you look into into processes for example the the well known iso 26262 in the automotive uh, it focuses less on let's say purely formal approaches and more on um, canonizing or maybe formalizing best practices in the engineering field and uh, certifying the the design and development process itself so it's sort of like a holistic approach that tries to mimic what, what has been done for thousands of years in in other engineering fields like civil engineering so capturing uh, best practices avoiding negligence avoiding poor craftsmanship uh, avoiding uh, you know unforeseen combination of uh, benign circumstances that could lead to some failures and also uh, you know somehow limiting uh, the possibility of business goals overriding safety and security goals there are some benefits to, to this uh, holistic practical approach. For example, uh, this naturally incorporates interaction with other systems, the interaction with, with users, etc. Uh, but, uh, and it is also a quite a flexible framework to be honest. But uh, the problem is that it does not really provide strong mathematical formal guarantees of correctness of those mixed criticality systems. It can really just provide statistical and probabilistic guarantees. Okay, uh, what what uh, should be done about this? Uh, again, I, I, I'm not not claiming that I know the answer. <laughs> that would be probably too easy. Uh, I, I think uh, that, that there has been tremendous progress in both sides. Uh, so in academia, uh, people have been uh, moving from toy examples to being able to tackle real world problems in an industry the approaches has been more and more uh, rigorous over time and i think this is great and i think uh, there is a good chance that we will meet we we will meet each other in the middle hopefully in the in the new future unfortunately there is no silver silver bullet but there are many many small bullets that might, we might uh, use and uh, these small bullets might actually help us you know uh, hunt down the enemy. But let me switch gears before before I finish. Uh, let me uh, talk about something completely different, or maybe not completely. I really believe that our greatest enemies are not failures, bugs, vulnerabilities. Uh, I really think that our greatest enemy in you know achieving a safe, secure, mixed criticality system uh, is our own desire to always build computer systems that are just slightly more complex than, than we can actually verify, slightly more uh, you know, complex that, that uh, we can tackle with our current, uh, current um, methods and tools. So I would really suggest, and maybe this is definitely a topic for a longer discussion, that we should somehow voluntarily tame up the complexity of our systems. Uh, we should. Uh, focus on on the fact that maybe you know the cost of potential liabilities and reputation damage really outweighs the let's say the cost of explaining to the customers why they are not getting you know the the, the newest bells and and whistles and also i think the the customers should change their mindset in in a way uh, i still see in many people that they think that computer systems are simply meant to fail that it's it's natural that that computer programs crash and nothing can be done about this and i think we should change i think we should demand that our computer systems do not crash our that our computer systems are reliable i really cannot express this better than what andy tannenbaum said uh, recently at eurosis 2021 uh, if one in a million, uh, if one in million car tires randomly exploding is not acceptable, why is still why is this still acceptable in software? Thank you very much, and I'm I would be happy to accept your questions. 
Okay, thanks, Martin. Very interesting. I think we have time for just one very short question. If anyone has any questions, please, please unmute yourself and go ahead to ask. Also, you can type in the chat box. But if you have some question for later on, here is the Martin's email. Also, he might be in the gather town, so you can catch up with him later as well. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. No one. Maybe I can ask some brief clarification. Actually, I I I I I kind of agree with you. Yeah. Like I, I worked actually with one EU pro EU project. So we were taking like demo car example that had like only 60, 70 renewables and some labels. Yeah. Whereas in actual car, it's like millions or something. So in academy, we play with two examples, whereas in industry, it's quite complex. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, like you said, they should kind of both try to come together, right? I mean, what do you see? Like, they should be coming through some projects, or there should be like academia to industry visits, or industrial to kind of academia visits, some, some more clarifications on that? Well, I, I would say that, that, uh... What, what could be done is, uh, you know, st starting with, with a product that is already, already out there, you know, like having a prototype that is not sort of, you know, future driven or, or you know, future looking, but, but looking into the past. So really taking, taking for example, a car that, that is 10 years old because it's still a good car. I mean, I know many people who are driving 10 year old cars and making sure that, you know, you know revisiting that, that uh, computer system, that mixed criticality system that is driving that car and verifying that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. I, I mean, it's really hard to, to make a business That's case it. out of this, but maybe, maybe people would appreciate that their old car is more safe than it used to be. I don't know. I mean, it's really a complex, complex topic. But okay. this is this is the way I'm thinking. This is the way I'm thinking. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Martin. Okay. We actually with this we move to the next talk, uh, which will be given by Professor Jeff Merritt, who is a, a professor at University of Southampton in UK. His research interests are in energy management of mobile and embedded systems and self-powered devices. And Jeff will be talking about energy-driven design. So Jeff, over to you, please. Thank you very much, um, Amit. And hopefully you can see my slides and, and hear me. Yes, yes, very clearly. Okay. Yeah, okay. Okay, wonderful. So, um, so hello everyone, where, wherever you are and whatever time it is. Um, very happy to be, be talking to you today about some of the challenges that uh, that we see and that we've been looking at in the area of what, what I refer to as energy driven design. Um, and particularly here, I'm going to focus in on self powered embedded systems and the, the motivation for that will, will hopefully become clear. So if we consider some of the, um, the speculation and hype around things like the Internet of Things, where there are predictions for, for trillions of connected devices within a period of, of really the next decade. And the question I would ask at, at that point is, well, how are we going to power all of these devices? Um, mains power is there and it's a very good um, option where it, is, uh, where it is attractive and effective and suitable. But I would suspect that a very significant proportion of those trillion devices are going to need to be locally powered in some way. They're not going to be able to be tethered to the wall, to the mains power system. And so that local powering really gives you the choice of um, some kind of sizable energy storage, uh, whether it's battery or a, a different type of um, energy storage mechanism that's going to allow your device to work for a period of many years, or it's going to be something else. And some of the challenges or, or potential issues with batteries um, are, are listed there. So I think um, we, we have the issue of maintenance or, or replacing batteries. If, if you consider that picture at the top um, left there, if, if all of the lights in those buildings were, uh, were battery powered IoT light switches, for example, um, then someone's going to have a job of every few years or you know, at best probably once a decade going around and either entirely replacing all of those light switches or changing all of the batteries in there. And it's a significant proportion of the, 
uh, of the world's workforce that would be required to do an activity like that if we got to the point of a, of a trillion battery powered devices. Um, there are issues around the, the, the contention between the lifetime we want that device to have and the miniaturization of that system, because typically the, the longer you want it to last, the bigger energy store you need to allow it to last that long. But typically we want smaller devices. We want this, uh, this vision of pervasive computing to mean that all of our devices um, shrink away um, uh, and become invisible. And the, the third factor I think really is this, this aspect of sustainability. And how sustainable is it to have a trillion or two trillion or five trillion batteries that we're regularly replacing in our systems? So how do we dispose of them at, the, at their end of life? But also just a more general question, how do we actually justify um, the energy that we're consuming from batteries? Because that energy still has to come from somewhere. And when we talk about sustainability, we usually talk about it at the large scale in terms of factories and houses and cars. And a battery powered device doesn't really compare to one of those applications in terms of energy usage. But when we scale this to trillions of devices, it, it does become a considerable um, component of that. And so I think it's gonna be increasingly questioned actually where energy is, uh, is being used in, in embedded devices and, and why it's being used in the way it is. And so an alternative to, uh, to batteries is the idea of self-powered systems or, or energy harvesting. Um, and we can take energy out of the environment from a, a range of different sources, um, as, as pictured on your screen here. And one of the, thing really, one of the things that, that um, is common among all these different sources is that typically their power or energy or voltage or current output is dynamic. It's not giving you a nice constant um, um, energy bucket like you get from a battery. And so the amount of power energy you get both varies temporally, uh, changes in time, and also it tends to vary spatially. So having your device in one location is gonna be very different to having your device in a different location. Um, and if you consider many IoT-like um, devices and IoT applications, the consumption is typically very dynamic as well, both in time and based on the environment um, that it's in or the, the, the events that are happening. And so one of the big issues we have in empowering IoT devices from energy harvesting is, is, this, um, is the coupling of a very variable supply with a very variable consumption. Um, and typically the way that people have done that in the past is by going back and sticking a big battery in the middle uh, to act as a bucket, to act as a buffer, to store that energy until it's needed. And what I'm talking about when I'm talking about energy driven computing is, is really just rethinking some of those decisions. And instead of solving this problem by saying, well, let's just stick something big in the middle there and, and, and sort out our problems in that way. It actually involves going back and thinking about what the application is that you're trying to implement, what your energy environment might be, both in terms of, uh, in terms of energy available and consumption and energy and devices and rethinking the, device, the design of that system. Um, now, just a quick caveat at, at, at this point, some applications are really compatible with this. They tend to be applications where the, um, the sensing task that you want to do, for example, or the activity that you want to monitor is very well correlated with the energy availability. And these things work really well. There are some applications where I think um, if you go away and actually think about what the purpose of that application is, not necessarily what it does at the moment, but what the user actually needed from it, then it can be really well rethought from this kind of energy driven perspective. But there are some applications, they might be safety critical, they might need continuous um, uh, compute, continuous um, activity that just won't be compatible with it, or that you may still be able to take an energy driven uh, thought process to, but end up with the same solution that you have before. Um, and just to give you a, a few examples of, of some of these, so the, the ones at the bottom here are, are typically uh, class one or two constrained devices. So. Um, either uh, very constrained devices with a, a simple radio on them or, or devices that can do a, uh, implement a, a networking stack but not a full um, IP stack, for example. Um, and just some examples. So the one on the left here is quite an old example uh, from uh, Massachusetts, I think, University of Massachusetts, um, where they, or maybe Michigan, um, where they put um, this um, inductive coil around power cables and instead of the, the kind of normal approach where you would then um, take a measurement of the, uh, of the current that you were generating and then send that as a measurement of, of how much power you were 
uh, was going through the cable. They simply charged up a capacitor and whenever it got to a certain level, sent out a radio beacon and then died and then repeated. And so the system then looked at how far apart those radio beacons were being received and that directly correlated to the amount of power being harvested. And as a result, they could get away with a much simpler and much smaller design. Um, the second one here is, a, um, is a, a pedometer that was harvesting energy actually from the footsteps. And it used that energy harvester to actually um, count the footstep as well. So it's more impulse driven rather than, again, having a continuous supply and trying to use an accelerometer or a pressure sensor to do that. Similar things with a, a bike computer, uh, instead of being permanently powered, this was, this was using the, the passing of a magnet um, past the coil, not only to generate energy, but also to use that um, impulse to, uh, to sense the speed um, that the wheel was going at as well uh, and, and working purely off it. Um, and then last year there was this, this um, self-powered Game Boy um, from TU Delft where the, um, the I think there's solar panels on it, I can't remember if it was also harvesting from the, the button presses as well. Um, the idea being that you're generally mashing the keypad and therefore it could, uh, it could stay awake. But one of the things really that connects all of these examples is the idea of, um, of intermittency, that they're only uh, or, or that they are, um, they are working gracefully um, to, uh, to be interrupted, to turn off. Uh, and this can be used in two ways. It can be a, a fail safe so that um, if your power supply was to be interrupted, you can recover from it. Or uh, most of the examples that, that, uh, that we look at are those where you're actually expecting the power to, uh, to regularly go away. So in these energy harvesting situations, and it is just a normal part of operation that your device will, will regularly die. Um, and so there's a whole range of approaches that have been looked at over the last, probably getting on for a decade now, in terms of how to effectively and efficiently um, checkpoint the state of these in, in, in appropriate places. And so there's, there's static, um, placement of checkpoints, there's been approaches that have broken um, the, the application up into atomic tasks uh, and ensuring that you can always complete a task and, and checkpointing beforehand. Um, or there's been a lot of work on reactive approaches that, that we've tended to focus on, where you detect when your power supply is about to die and at that point you save the state and recover it when you come back on again. And you kind of continually um, do this uh, often many times a second. There's a whole host of challenges. I, I obviously can't go into them much um, in the interests of time here, uh, but those challenges go from uh, making this checkpointing process as efficient as possible. The definition of efficiency is slightly different in, those, in these systems. It's, it's, it's actually how much forward useful progress you can make through your application rather than just how efficiently you can, uh, you can perform. Um, and sometimes you actually make uh, kind of sub-efficient uh, decisions that still result in you uh, being able to get as far through uh, the program as possible. Um, we've looked at and, and, and uh, the community has looked at how, that we, can, how we can make sure that the, the state that is saved is always correct and that you avoid um, uh, issues that might occur either through um, external memory or non-volatile memory being internally, um, uh, internally changed uh, or through um, having um, tasks that are larger than, uh, than are possible to execute with the amount of energy you're going to have. So you continually just roll back to the same checkpoint. Um, there's been a reasonable amount of work on design tools, so how we can uh, improve this process for programmers and, and mask it from the programmers, building support into operating systems and also uh, into design flows. I'll talk a bit about, uh, about Fused in a second. And also looking beyond compute to other peripherals that might exist in the system as well, and how we can make sure that their state is also consistent, consistently preserved. Um, other challenges are brought up by emerging uh, non-volatile memory technologies, and most of the, the technology and uh, most of the approaches that have been looked at have been based on either flash or FRAM. Now, new memory technologies that come up, uh, are coming along have very different uh, properties and performance. That needs to change how we look at some of these issues as well. Um, one simple example of this um, is the idea of um, using a, a page memory system uh, for an embedded processor um, to allow us to better track uh, what data has changed. Um, again, in the interest of time, I won't go through it, uh, but at 
uh, particularly at, at higher speeds of interruption. So if uh, we're only on for a very small periods of time, we can get quite substantial savings um, in the um, in the runtime as a result of this. Um, one thing I'd just like is the last thing I'm talking about, Amit, don't worry. Um, yeah. But um, I wanted to talk about was this uh, design tool, really. And, and one of the issues with these kinds of systems is that we have um, a very difficult, a very different power supply to a traditional embedded system. And this makes it a kind of um, very difficult to not only explore what might happen in that system and debug it, uh, but also repeatedly um, test as well and do design space exploration and so on. Um, so this tool called Fused that, uh, that you can look into more at the web link at the top there um, is an open source simulator that, that we've developed using System C that allows closed loop um, uh, simulation and emulation of the energy environments as well as uh, mixed signal um, devices. So it models both a, a timing accurate microcontroller as well as the rest of the system as well. Um, so just to give you a very quick example of this, um, it can model a complete system through from the event, uh, the energy environment, the circuitry um, that go that it goes through to process that energy, the microcontroller, sensor, and radio module, and simulate it in a in a closed um, loop. So you can actually see what the effect of your um, software changes might be on the energy consumption and the the energy availability. Um, and that's just an output trace from that, um, showing the kind of um, useful information it can provide. Okay, so um, in summary, there, there's, there's a range of challenges that, that this really does throw up compared to traditional systems. Um, most of them, I would say, although they're being explored, are, are not completed. And I would say that most so far have really focused on the compute uh, and the processor rather than the rest of a system. Uh, and advances are definitely still needed in terms of supporting design tools. Um, new non-volatile memory technologies are going to change things as well. Uh, and I think one of the most significant challenges is really in, um, is in communication and how we do networking communication across um, devices that are unpredict unpredictable when they're on and typically not on at the same time. Um, and I will leave it at that. Uh, my email address is there if you have any follow-up questions. Great. Thanks, Jeff. Um, I don't know if any, there is any question from anyone from the audience. I think we can take one a short question. I have some, I think maybe I will clarify with you later. Maybe but, uh, 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 one quick question, Akash here. Yeah. So you mentioned that one of the challenges is to basically uh, communicate between these devices actually. I think you may be aware of the work of Marco Zimmerling where he tries to find the patterns of different communicating devices and yeah. sort of predict when they may come online again and find a way to make a protocol to communicate between uh, these devices, actually. Uh, yeah, yes, there's, some, there's, yeah, there's some interesting work on, on that kind of problem of synchronization and, and how they can um, kind of force themselves to, to shift along and, and eventually line up so that they can communicate. Um, there's also some interesting work um, that's been going on, I think in, in Marco's group, but also in my group around using wake up radios to to kind of shift the cost of, of that communication onto the transmitter instead, so that it's, it's kind of one way instead. Um, it's something that there's, there's emerging research on and I'm seeing a lot more starting to come out about it, but I think it's one of the big challenges if we really want to realize um, more normal IoT systems rather than just independent devices. Indeed, thanks. Okay. Right. I think we can move to the next session. So next one will Hello. be one. Uh, thanks, Jeff. Yeah, next one will be on cross-layer reliability aware design by Professor Akash Kumar, who is uh, from DU Dresden. His research interests span uh, across uh, various aspects of design automation in the context of embedded reconfigurable systems with particular emphasis on low power systems, fault tolerant systems, uh, optimization of arithmetic circuits and approximate compute. Over to you, Akash. Thanks a lot, Amit. Uh, so hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Akash Kumar. My slide has somehow gone away now. Ah, there yeah, we are. Yeah, so yeah. I'll primarily focus on the cross-layer reliability after having heard about the energy computing and the um, constraints of mixed criticality systems. So I'll talk about various aspects. In the interest of time, I won't go through all the details, but I do have all the details on the slides themselves. So because we have the slides uh, being recorded, you can always go to them afterwards and in case of questions, uh, drop me an email uh, easily or email, uh, meet up in Gathertown, for example. So I'll first explain what cross-layer reliability is and why do we really need that actually? 
how do we model and analyze uh, cross layer reliability in multiprocessor embedded architectures? Uh, how do we do mapping and then adapt these mappings uh, depending on the task requirements at runtime? And if we have time, I'll go a bit about hardware hardware partitioning. And in the end, what are the paths forward to design even better platforms? So what exactly is cross layer reliability? As we all may, as you all may know, actually there are different sources of faults which we have in the system, ranging from intermittent permanent faults and transient faults. And as we are going towards smaller and smaller device sizes, the overall failure rate has been increasing um, uh, for in all stages of a particular system. So in the initial part, the regular operation time of three to 10 years, and also in the aging part and the failure wear out rate as well, it has been constantly increasing. So how can we really live with such increasing fault rates? Uh, so typical approaches which talk about reliability management look at a single layer reliability. That implies they look at phenomenon-based approach. That means the layers above, if you look at the devices, circuit architecture to the software level, everybody below assumes that you have a perfect hardware, perfect layer below them. That means there is no more error coming towards their application layer. But this is becoming more and more infeasible as we go towards smaller nodes of transfer sizes. Therefore, there's actually a need to look at cross-layer reliability exploration, which basically takes benefit of implicit uh, fault masking across different layers. That is to say that not all the faults which occur at the devices layer are actually propagated to the circuits layer. Similarly, all faults at circuits may not be propagated to the architecture and the layers above. Yeah. Therefore, how can we design a system which takes this fault masking into consideration and provides the end-to-end -end application constraints reasonably. Yeah. So um, one of the aspects or challenges in the uh, cross-layer reliability of our designs is to take benefit of this implicit fault masking that I was talking about. And the reason why you have fault masking is because you have different approaches which can be applied. And even if they don't provide full 100% protection, only some errors propagate through and therefore you have less errors to deal with at the later layers. Uh, so the other challenge when you talk about the cr uh, uh, cross-layer library design is to design a system which is quality of service aware from end to end. Now the big challenge over there is that different applications domains have different kinds of reliability constraints. For example, uh, you have real-time systems like Airplane, for example, which have timing reliability constraints. You have banking or financial applications which have functional requirement uh, of reliability and therefore the, the importance is on getting the correct result even if it takes somewhat longer to get the correct result lastly you have systems like a uh, satellite for example which have to be in operation for 20 years or even longer actually therefore ensuring that you have a lifetime reliability you are able to operate the system for as long as possible is the key requirement so how do you ensure you can deal with all these varying requirements at runtime yeah. The other, probably the biggest challenge in my view in a cross layer reliability design is the huge design space exploration or other explosion as you want to call it actually. Yeah. So already if you have an application with multiple tasks which have to run on heterogeneous platform, you have multiple design alternatives. Now, if you add to it the complexity of each of these design points being further able to be mapped on different reliable, different levels of reliability on the hardware, you go into all together a different domain. Yeah, so uh, why is it so complex and how can we actually deal with it in a uh, rather in a uh, decent design flow? Uh, so in order to actually create a nice full level design flow, what we first of all need is to understand what are the overheads of different reliability approaches and how efficient they are in providing protection to your hardware. And this we actually do with the, with the design time models and also with the use of runtime models, which are able to basically adapt themselves depending on the current operating conditions, they're able to adjust the level of reliability, uh, fault-tolerant approaches, and then provide the best result at runtime. Yeah. So there have been uh, quite some works actually, which for example, try to model the functional reliability uh, in terms of fault masking across the layers of system stacks. So they basically model which, uh, how much fault masking are you able to achieve through different layers and how many faults are really propagated across the layers. We also did some work in the past, which did quite some work in the past in trying to model the function reliability as a Markov chain based model in order to reason about the end to end reliability 
depending on the fault masking across different layers. Yeah, and um, I won't go through all the details, but uh, just to give an idea over here, this Marco chain based approach over here takes a much longer time as opposed to a CDF based probability, uh, probability estimation, but it's also more accurate as opposed to a simple CDF based approach actually. Yeah. Now in terms of task mapping actually, um, as I already mentioned, we have a design space explosion, not only exploration, because of the huge possibilities that you have available in order to map a task and to choose what level of cross layer reliability should I apply for different layers. Uh, for example, if you consider different degrees of freedom, like um, a DBFS, heterogeneity, task P, binding task scheduling, and again, then choosing, choosing from different energy approaches, which one should I choose? We get many, many, many options and finding the right one can be quite uh, time consuming and tedious. And therefore we propose approaches on how we can do cross reliability approaches to get the best Pareto front from these many options actually. And in fact, regular design flow based, uh, obviously exhaustive approaches don't work at all. And uh, for these uh, works, we have proposed something called uh, multi-objective evolutionary algorithm based uh, methods to propose multi-stage and guided search approaches to explore the design space quickly and also provide a decent Pareto space in the end. And we are also now looking at different uh, search methods, uh, which um, try a combination of a depth first and a breadth first search to quickly explore the solution space and arrive at the solution space, in particular using Monte Carlo tree search that we presented last week actually in VLSI SOC. A few words about dynamic adaptation. Um, so we did quite, uh, as you reach towards the wear out period actually, the fall rate starts increasing. And if you still want to be able to operate the device in this wear out phase where the failure rate increases significantly actually, what you need to do is to be able to predict which processors or components in my system are most likely to fail in the near future. And based on that, you can actually do swapping of the tasks from the, uh, let's say the P's that are likely to fail into P's that are more healthy. And that way you are able to prolong the lifetime of a overall circuit to ensure your mission can work for as long as possible actually. And in that particular context, what we have been looking at is not only at the design time based approaches, but also a hybrid DSC, uh, which is a combination of design time and a runtime approach where we look at various options that are computed beforehand. And depending on the current runtime configuration, we look at the energy consumption of the current solution and the solution we want to take and also consider the reconfiguration cost of moving from one to the other option at runtime. And based on that, we provide the best option uh, considering both the design time and the runtime approaches. Yeah. And to speed that kind of search, we actually propose a reconfiguration on agent-based approach uh, DAC, uh, two years ago actually, which allows you to find the cheapest uh, reconfigurable option, taking into account the cost of reconfiguration and the cost of operating the new solution. Um, hardware hardware partitioning is another very interesting aspect, which I won't go into too much of the details, but the idea over here is that uh, if you don't have only hardware software partitioning, but you have multiple hardware options, let's say in FPGA, you have multiple partially reconfigurable regions to map your tasks into, uh, how do you determine where should you map the tasks and also take into account the time for reconfiguration from one bit stream to the next? And how do you then maximize the reliability of your approaches? Uh, in particular, we look at the system MTTF, uh, mean time to failure in the number of years. And as we can see from here, we are able to increase from about five years to 15 years just by choosing a different kind of algorithm, uh, mapping on the hardware and different kind of partitioning in that context. And this can be done actually also for different objectives like lifetime or functional reliability, for example. A few words about what are the paths forward actually. So first of all, um, what we really need actually is to have a tunable methods for fall detection and mitigation, right? So since we are dealing with a cross layer reliability that implies we have to be able to choose at which layer we should apply which mechanism to what extent. Yeah, so it's not like you either apply zero or 100% of this method, but somewhere in the middle can be also applied like 50%, for example, redundancy can be applied on a particular system. So such kind of tunability is extremely important to be able to apply such that we can provide end-to-end -end constraints with the fault masking of a particular layer. Um, one example we've been looking at there is inexact TMR and approximate computing also to provide such configurable redundancy in the system. 
The other requirement I would say would be to model and abstract not only functional reliability, but also timing and lifetime reliability as you go from the devices layer of the stack all the way up to the algorithmic stack actually. Yeah. And lastly, I would say, I mentioned already about the uh, design space explosion, which we have at the moment. It would be nice to see if we can leverage some of the emerging AI and machine learning based techniques, for example, to be able to predict and um, span, uh, span the entire, traverse the whole design space uh, in a short amount of time, not only in the design time, but also perhaps have to, some runtime mechanisms to be able to do that uh, quickly. Uh, that's it from me. So just some last words. So cross reliability is really, really, really important to design reliable systems with modern unreliable components. Yeah, and it basically allows you to exploit fault masking across multiple layers and provide the methodology to uh, identify to which layer should you, uh, to which extent should you configure which layer of uh, reliability across different stack. Yeah, that's it from me. And I'll be now happy to take any questions if you guys have. Thanks, Akash. I think uh, yeah, we have kind of, we are running a bit late, but I would say if anyone has any short question, uh, uh, please just uh, unmute yourself and ask. Yeah, otherwise we will yeah, we will move to the next talk. I have some questions. Maybe if you are in the gather town, or like I will, I will ask later. Sure. Yeah, we can Not do that. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> because those are lengthy ones. Yeah, <laughs> sure, we can do that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thanks, everyone. So thanks, Akas. I will just uh, now go ahead by sharing my screen. So, okay, everyone. So I am the last speaker as well. So I am uh, an associate professor at University of Essex. Um, and my research interests are design and optimization of multi-core based computing systems with the focus on several metrics like performance, temperature, uh, reliability, and uh, security as well, yeah? So, and I will be covering mainly the security aspect here. So I hope uh, you can see my screen. Akash, if you can confirm, you can see my- uh, Yes, I can, but I see a small version, not the full screen version. Not the full screen. Maybe, maybe because, I have, the displays. because I have connected another display, yeah. Ah, okay, maybe we can stop the displays over there, then it might work. Now? Yeah, that works better. Okay, Thanks. great. So actually I will be talking about aging and covert channel attacks and their uh, mitigations. So these are the authors of uh, kind of this particular section in the paper, which is also available on ACM. So I'm the, basically Amit Kumar Singh, like I said earlier. So first of all, some brief about attacks and mitigations, yeah? So why attacks basically happen? So we all know to get basically sensitive and confidential information, yeah? And what are these attack effects? So in general, and in terms of aging and covert channel attacks, so basically they can cause severe damages such as financial health and emotional as well. Yeah, and what is their mitigations? So basically it is to timely detect them and then have some countermeasures. So basically if we are not able to timely detect them, that means that these are not proper defense. Yeah, if we detect quite late, the harm is already going to happen. So now coming to the aging attack, that is the first one that I wanted to cover. So one of the ways to do aging attack is actually planned obsolescence, yeah? So what is it? Basically, this is to deliberately set product to mal malfunction within a certain period of time. So what could be the motivation behind it? Suppose there is some company, so they can release some new products, yeah? And they can try to set old version products to malfunction so that basically you are forced to upgrade to the new, new version of the product, yeah? And this sort of actually uh, kind of practice has been observed in some kind of literature or some, some uh, practices that has been followed in the past. So what is uh, this uh, setting the product malfunction? I mean, actually how it can be done. So by crafting malicious programs through various upgrades in the system or inserting hardware backdoors that can be in the form of like hardware trojans and they can be exploited to accelerate aging of key components. And what these key components actually can be, these could be the ones that are typically used a lot, and we can also refer them as hotspot mode, okay? So let's look this with an example that is knock aging failure, yeah? So here on the left-hand side, 
you see a three by three knot where one of the core that is in the middle has become faulty. So this could be because of its aging, because it is handling a lot of uh, traffic or processing a lot of data and by kind of diverting all the data to that core. And if that fails, actually, this can be still handled because there is a core redundancy. On the right hand side, it shows a router has failed again because of the aging. And if that fails, actually, entire chip can be considered as a fail. Yeah. So the whole system lifetime will be defined as the lifetime of that particular router. So this could be actually manufacturer's preference as soon as the warranties expire. Yes. Yeah? And this is to basically maximize the profit. So here in the paper, we have described what could be the profit model. Suppose some, someone is releasing IF version device. So the profit would be price of that version device minus the cost into the number of units that are being basically sold for that specific version. And that can be computed as summation of here in the middle, you can see the equation. So that can be summation of all the previous version devices that has been upgraded to the new version as a result of this planned obsolescence attack, plus S0, that is basically new customers coming anyway to the company. Yeah. So this is how basically the profit can be made. So now going back to the aging attack algorithm. So here, actually first I want to give some overview, like how exactly this can, this can happen and why this happens. Yeah. So this graph actually shows the change in transistor threshold voltage over the time. So what happens like over the time, the threshold voltage of the transistor changes due to aging effects. And this after a certain point where the, that can be like a failure threshold, the device is going to fail, yeah? For example, in this graph, if the change in the uh, threshold voltage of the transistor reaches 10, then the device is going to fail, yeah? So here there could be some normal way of working or some aggressive way of working in the chip, yeah? So one of these is like normal condition, yeah? So the red line you can see here. So if we are going with this down the line around, around three years, your threshold voltage will reach 10 and that is the point basically the device will fail. But there could be some aggressive aging as well where the kind of you can try to accelerate the aging and the device is going to fail much earlier, even before one year, yeah? And something can be like plant obsolescence. So where we say basically you plant something like before the warranty, you don't try to accelerate the aging, but after the warranty, you try to accelerate. So this could be the company's preference. The first one aggressive aging can be actually some customer's preference to just get their upgraded, uh, get an upgraded version of the device, yeah? So here actually what we have done in each router, we have kind of uh, inserted one trigger unit that basically decides when to accelerate or when to decelerate the aging of that specific router. So just after the warranty, we can actually exploit accelerating and how it can be done. So this is one example here. So where some packets are being sent from the source to the destination, from the gray to the uh, yellow color uh, router. So here somewhere in the middle is the hot spot node. So basically you can sort of divert the packet to that node before reaching the destination. So basically you are helping to age that faster. So basically making them, they're making that fail early. Yeah. Sim similarly, if you want to kind of decelerate, decelerate, basically you want to avoid the uh, kind of fault. So what you can do basically just avoid that particular hot spot instead. So you can follow simple X, Y route. Yeah, so this is some algorithm and these details are, more details are present in the paper. And the second component I wanted to cover actually is thermal covered channel. Yeah, so what is it actually here? There is some sort of channel and some data is transferred. So here for the thermal covered channel, we use heat as a media to secretly leak information. So here the transmitter sends the sensitive data via the heat and the receiver records the temperature signal by reading its own thermal sensor and then it decodes the signal to recover the original data. So this is an example of an eight core chip where you can see core A is in the secure zone and that is just transmitting the data to a core that is in non-secure zone. So some thermal signals over the time and B also decodes like what is the secret data that has that, that is being received at its ends, yeah? 
So it could be decoded as, as like, if there's no change in the temperature, that could be bit zero. And if there is kind of high to low, that could be bit one. So there's some decoding mechanisms, yeah? And this is an active research topic, and we have also made some contributions. So one of the contributions actually we made is an enhanced thermal to cover channel attack, yeah? So it's like uh, some sort of attack has already ha happened, but you are kind of trying to able to detect it, but later you, uh, you basically try to kind of uh, uh, makes a better arrangement to still leak the information, yeah? So what happens here, if, like I said earlier, there will be a transmitting module that, that will keep on sending the sensitive information, the receiver, receiver will receive it, and it will generate some acknowledgement for the transmitter, and the, where there will be a, a, a acknowledgement analyzing module for the transmitter. So as soon as everything goes fine, transmission will keep on happening. But what could happen, suppose you detect that such a transmission happening, so what one can do actually is he can inject or he, he or she can inject a small thermal noise at the transmission frequency. So basically this leads to the jamming of that particular channel, yeah? So basically then the, all the information that goes from the transmitter to the receiver is sort of meaning, meaningless, yeah? So if such kind of things are detected, what we could do actually, we can have some dynamic frequency changing trigger where you, the transmitter and the receiver can agree to different transmission and receiving frequency, and they can still keep on continuing to transmit the data. So this is something we have proposed, and this happens quite dynamically as well. Yeah? So, so for this dynamic frequency changing trigger, actually there are several approaches like self-checking, failure counter check, and TCC times out. I, actually, I can't go into the details of all these because we don't have time. So just for like self-checking how this one works, actually it, it works, it is like on the transmitter side, it reads the, the sensor values, that means temperature values that are sent. And it also knows what is exactly the, the bit that is being transferred. So it just compare those things. If they are differing a lot, that means the channel is being jammed here. Yeah? So that basically triggers to the, some changing of the frequencies that should happen between the transmitter and receiver so that they can still continue this covered channel-based uh, sensitive data leaking. Yeah? So how that change will happen, basically now a new frequency will be selected and then frequency changing request will be sent to the receiver and then they will agree to a common frequency and then the frequency is changed. So that's just kind of quite simple, like I said earlier. So what could be the countermeasure? So basically this could be done with the scanning and channel aware jamming. So basically what you can do, you can emit noise with the same frequency of the covered channel instead of full band jamming. So full band jamming, you can imagine like there is a lot of possible frequencies at which the communications will happen. But if you are going to kind of jam all of the, those, it's going to take a lot of power, yeah? So that's not a wise idea. So basically in this approach, we have we have kind of tried to identify that specific transmission frequency with a high scanning speed and thus jamming only that specific particular frequency. So this is like the whole idea and more details are actually through this particular figure and it's also in the paper. I think we don't have time uh, to go through that. So I will not go at the moment, yeah? But we can meet and gather down to uh, get more picture or more ex explanations of it. So the paths forward that we see actually, there would be increasing types of aging and covered channel attack. Yeah? So we saw, I showed one example of enhanced thermal covered channel attack. Yeah, one type of aging attack, but we see like there will be several other types of attacks that will be coming into picture in near future. And there should be some joint consideration of various attacks. Yeah? So, so far, I mean, you saw, I, I'm considering aging attacks separately and covered channel attacks separately but these all should be considered together and possibly some other types of attacks as well. And we need to have actually cost-effective countermeasures. So there are several ways. Yeah, some people are trying with the kind of hardware base and some people are trying to have the software base. So, so typically like hardware-based countermeasures can be costly. So it's better to have basically some combination of them so we can get basically cost-effective and effective countermeasures. 
And these are actually some references published in TCAT last year, this year, and some in general subsystem systems architecture where there are more detailed concepts what we just briefed. Thank you. And if you have any questions now, I can take now if we have time. Yeah. I don't know how much time we have left. Well, at six o'clock, but there are two, there are two uh, questions in the chat. If you can maybe read them. Yeah. yeah. Okay, one is, yeah, I see. So nowadays warranty can be extended to or annual maintenance options are there. How does plant aging work? Yeah, that's good. That's good a question, very good. So I would say, I mean, if you see like how much the warranty can be extended, yeah? So you can target at that point, yeah? You need not to target basically at very initial point, yeah? So like how much will be the maximum extended warranty? So you just target at that point actually. So just let everything accelerate at that point and then you just let the, basically make the chip dead, yeah? I think there could be some more interesting discussions, but I think that could be one simple answer to that, yeah? And how do the malicious application communicate to switch frequencies when their communication channel is already jammed? So what we have done here, I think this is also an interesting question. So there are a set of agreed frequencies from the transmitter and the receiver side. So they have already kind of made an arrangement. So this is, they will be switching to the next one and there will be limited set and the receiver knows that. So when a request from the transmitter is sent, it's just going to identify like which one it has switched to. So it's some sort of like pre-arranged uh, kind of a set of frequencies. Thus it knows basically uh, th this will be some limited set. Yeah. So this is how they can do it. Yeah. Okay, great. So actually we are over the time. I think uh, some of us, we are going to the uh, gather town. So I kind of uh, request you guys, whoever can. So we meet there and have some more interesting discussions. And with this, actually, we end the session. Hope you got some learning and you can apply in your research. Yeah. And for more details, we are always happy to help. And their papers are always there. Okay. That's great. Thanks, everyone. Goodbye. Thanks for organizing it. Bye bye. Anyways, bye. Thanks. Bye. Thank Take you. Care. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you.